Welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations, the podcast for bridging academic landscapes. At Access to Perspectives, we provide novel insights into the communication and management of research. Our goal is to equip researchers around the world with the skills and enthusiasm they need to pursue a successful career. You will get insights around the topics of scholarly reading, writing and publishing, career development, project management and research integrity, all embedded into open science practices. Learn more about our work at accesstoperspectives.org. Oh, another day, another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Thank you so much to Ibuka Ezeke also for the introduction and um, all the work with the, with the processing and and editing of the versions or the several episodes that you listeners um, get to hear about. Today, I'm very happy to be welcoming Maha Said, who's joining us from Paris. Is that it? Right? Yeah, yes. Um, and you, you are a nanoparticles researcher, and we will be talking today around a topic that we've touched upon a few times, but now from a nanoparticles discipline specific point of view, that is peer review and research integrity, and mm -hmm. particularly also exploring aspects of replicability, reproducibility, the difference mm -hmm. of the two uh, and the overlaps. Um, I myself also find it difficult to differentiate between the two, and there's okay. some maybe some some definition servicing to be done here <laughs> <laughs> um but also like the whole intention with us clarifying on this or uh, specific or uh, talking about these topics is to how can we enable reusability or reuse of the research accomplishments now within the nanoparticles research community and yeah with with these aspects in mind so welcome very much again uh -huh. Thanks Thank for joining you so much us. for having me. And diving in, could we start by sharing with us a few sentences around your current or today, like your scholarly career path so far, brought you into the position where you're now at? And yes. yeah, and why you choose nanoparticles of all the choices you have within academia? <laughs> That's something about these tiny objects. And <laughs> And yeah, so we get to know you a little better. Okay, so um, so I come from a biology background. I have done my master's in molecular and biology, uh, focused on genetics and cancer genetics in specific. Then I did my PhD also molecular and cellular neurobiology, focused also on um, cancer research mainly. I did that in, in Paris. Um, then... That's where actually I started to get more interested in research integrity during my PhD. So, um, yeah, I, I think know why what what caught your interest um, integrity in particular was there some. I mean, usually people stumble about um, issues they experience yeah. and then they dig in. Okay, what's behind and why is this happening? Was that similar to you? Yes. So this is uh, this is actually how it happened uh, to me. I. I was working on an, an antibody for a protein and uh, it was not really very, it was not very known, this protein, let's say it works in the DNA damage response. So I ordered this antibody and I put it to the test and it doesn't work. And okay, maybe we just said it's a batch. It's a different batch. Maybe it just didn't work. So maybe we try again, we tried again and again and again, and it still was not working. I started to look into literature to see who else has worked with this specific antibody, who has done some immunofluorescence using this. And um, not too many responses from people. I think this is unfortunately how things uh, are, are working sometimes. Yeah, and just from like, I, I know many people experience that, and I'm just trying to, yeah, I don't know, to give some possible reasoning because people move on with their projects, they're busy, they might also, in some cases, I think there should be a notification, but maybe they don't even check that email in inbox anymore um, because they've acquired a new one or 
Well, in the worst case, it's because they actually have doubts themselves, so I wouldn't reply. But <laughs> this is <laughs> That's, that's... Which is quite sad. I mean, I try to get in touch most of the time with the with the corresponding authors, which mm. most of them are still in the same place with the same email address. But I started, yeah, I started looking deeper into every antibody I would use, into every research article I would read. I would look more into these antibodies to make sure you know how were these done, what are the different protocols, and all this. Mm. And for one article. I saw that two antibodies were used that were raised in the same species and they were used together at the same time and they showed co-localization, which was uh, very surprising for the team at the time. And to me, I mean, I I was a bit shocked that, you know, you cannot use two antibodies really with a very basic protocol targeting two different proteins and be shocked when they really co- co-localize. Mm. So this is where things start to get a bit not that great and I started having doubts which to me was really sad because mm. like I I came really so enthusiastically into this PhD program looking forward you know to make a change and as I said I did my research mainly it was a cancer hospital so you walk into this hospital you look at these patients you see them and you think you know they look at you like you're a beacon of hope to them and you're going to make a difference and you go to work like this every day, and then you see these kind of problems in the literature, and you're like, oh, well, what are we doing? Yeah. And this is when yeah, things start to get a bit shaky for me. And I started looking more into it, and I started seeing that, no, um, we, we unfortunately, we cannot really trust everything we are seeing these days. Mm. And this is where I started to read more on research integrity, and this is how it went in. Was it possible for you to turn to colleagues to discuss what you um, discovered? Yeah, so I I talked to to my PI at the time and also like senior like postdocs mm-hmm. talked to them because I was practically the youngest uh, member of the team, and they all said to me like yeah we we see this and um, I mean really you're like I feel like at some point we they they felt a bit like what can we do. Mm-hmm. You you did what you can. You emailed the 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 PI or the corresponding authors, and you got no response. What else can you do? And at the time, I was not really aware of so many things I am now, like Puppier and all this, where you can really, I think, bring this up a bit. I mean, to to the table a bit more, and it's a bit more um, prominent. Or maybe it's about kind of putting people on the spot, kind of publicly, mm-hmm. which makes them respond sometimes, which is quite sad. But yeah, mm. so this is this is actually how it started. Well, okay, yeah. I mean, this whole is is sad that we need to deal with such situations. I also in my trainings and um, when I talk in different contexts about issues of integrity, it's also sad that people get under such high pressure to turn to such behavior to advance. Mm-hmm. Their Careers because it might be the only way to, to for them to they see to succeed. Yeah. Um. After having tried for years, months or years, and they mm-hmm. won't work, and then you know at some point you have to publish because otherwise you're screwed. Yeah. Career. Yes. Yeah, and and then you can turn to industry, which might not be the worst um, option, but the <laughs> thought of it after you're striving to become a professor or research group leader is yeah. just yeah so well, yeah and this is i think also one of the reasons why we're having this whole discussion around open science largely in the community and mm-hmm. particularly about integrity so as you now we're digging deeper and deeper into that topic what mm-hmm. made you feel excited about and where did you now find a hook to adhere to where you feel you can make a difference so um, at at the moment, I just felt like I was a kind of helpless, which is a bit sad. And the honesty, when I came across the the ad for the project I'm in now, I'm my postdoc, and um, this is where I thought, wait, there's a project that is only focused on making a difference, or at least understanding why not much is being done, or what are really the barriers to the self-correction of science and all this and this is where I was like oh wow when I saw the ad I was like I need to apply to this and when I sent in my application 
I, I put in my application, like, even if I am not selected, I want to really feel, follow on and see the updates of this project because I really want to know what, what's going to happen with this and how it's going to go. And this is how I came into the Nanobubbles project, mm -hmm. which happened to be a nano a nanoscience project. And um, okay, yeah, wait, I work because with a, yeah. sorry, in the introduction, so you're not really... Uh... Or were you already in your bioscience career looking into nanoparticles? Like, no, no, not at all. Not a, so this is like just my own, just, yes. your whole venture. Because in biology and dealing with genetics and molecular biology is also things that you cannot really see with your sure. bare eyes, yeah. but yes. you're making experiments <laughs> to assume to know what you, what you then in parts can also make visible through uh, the said fluorescent um, tagging. But yes. so nano part, nanoparticles, um, mm -hmm. just from the concept of dealing with those tiny things. Like, do you do you look much at the content? Well, clearly you do. Checking for mm -hmm. integrity issues. Yeah. Um, they're coming from a molecular level. Now looking at the nano level, just conceptually, how does it feel? <laughs> It's a bit strange sometimes. Um, I still ask questions all the time, like, wait, what? Like, how, how, how tiny, how small, how, how does that work? You know, how I feel like I'm a bit of a giant in a very tiny world, <laughs> and um, which is quite interesting, I think, uh, to think of. But yeah, uh, I find it a bit difficult sometimes to really wrap my head around uh, like different concepts and the claims that are being made sometimes. Again, the field of of nanoscience, at least I, I see it in a way that it's really at the interface of like chemistry, physics, and it has applications in biology. Mm -hmm. So it's a mix of things. And in our team, we have a physicist, uh, a chemist that's uh, that specialized mainly in nano research and myself, a biologist. Mm -hmm. And we look at things from different perspectives. And it's nice to see how each one of us really focuses on one part mainly in it's just no, that's the beauty of research and also interdisciplinary yeah. research for that matter, looking at now it's tiny particles, but coming from different disciplines and experiences and expertises yes. therein makes like hopefully makes sense of it all. So okay. <laughs> so what what does a day in your life look like? How how do you how do you check for integrity in nano particle research? Yeah, so um so currently I'm working on, on two sub projects, one which is the post-publication peer review um, initiative, and we have a replication or reproducibility initiative um, that we set up. So the post-publication peer review is practically, um, we, we look at articles that are in a specific topic. So we have, a, I mean, the project is called Nanobubbles because these are bubbles in, in the field of nanoscience. And by bubbles, I mean concepts that have um, very weak bases, but have grown by hype, over promise, have got lots of funding thrown into them. And the research and the field where the topic kept growing bigger and bigger, okay. even though it's on very shaky grounds. Okay, so it's literally, as you would imagine, a soap bubble, but you can easily poke yeah. in a burst because there's not much substance behind. Yes. Um, so okay. this is so we have three main bubbles that we're looking into. We won't go into the technicalities, but um, so we have a specific topic, and we the first step is to find articles that really look into our our topic of interest. And uh, once we do that, we have a corpus of articles, and then we do a critical analysis. So we're a group. Of, of four also different backgrounds that look into these, well, actually we're five. We also have a philosopher of science with us that helps with all wow. the analysis. Yes. <laughs> so we have a, a bit of a, a framework that we have. We look into the um, the hypotheses, the claims that are being made in these articles. Are these claims supported? Are they, now? how are they, why are they there mainly? Mm -hmm. Um, we look at also references sometimes because sometimes they're, you know, there are references that are unfortunate. There's miscitations that we see sometimes. And we look also at figures, at results. We look at protocols to see if they make sense, the methodology section. Mm. 
So mainly it's us really critically reading the articles, commenting on the different aspects. Um, and sometimes when you really look with a critical eye, you find way more than you're expecting, unfortunately. Mm. Um, after that, we what we do is we um, start to draft a, a comment. So we use PubPeer, which is an online platform for post-publication peer review. And um, yeah, we use it quite often. This practically the comments that we have on these articles, we post them there. And um, just, yeah, wait for responses. Uh, best case scenario, we get a response. Um, maybe even best case scenario is if something was wrong with like images that were duplicated by mistake, they get corrected, that's great. Um, sometimes we get no responses, unfortunately. But uh, sometimes I think it's a way to really get the community stirred, to just at least pay attention that something's not necessarily working there. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you post one comment and then you see other researchers commenting after you posted, asking more questions for or clarifications. And yeah. Yeah. And um, so I, I, I also getting in touch with journals and journal editorial teams. Mm -hmm. And what's the response there? I'm... Yeah, I assume from what I've seen in, in similar initiatives that it's also mixed. Some are very responsive, but then the responsiveness by email and then the actual taking action to withdraw or retract a, a paper and then flag it as carrying misinformation of some sort. Or for them having the same issue like you have to go get touch, in touch with the authors, getting their standpoint. Because also everybody should deserve the, the opportunity to, to defend themselves at yeah. least or clarify. Or, yeah, or to self-correct or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, it also depends. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get a response from an editor saying, okay, we'll look into this. And not necessarily, you will not necessarily hear back. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you hear back that they are... Um, actually convinced by the authors that these are not exactly the same image and that it was just, I don't know, a different condition or something, even though they really look a bit too similar, let's say. Mm. Um, and sometimes you just got no response. Honestly, the, the like, I think in-person experience we've had mainly at conferences when we go, um, you find the publishers there, you speak to some of them. Um, and there's, I mean, sometimes they're in the scientific community, sometimes they say, well, you know, it's really on to you to make a difference. How are we supposed to make it? I mean, you're part of the scientific community, right? Like when we flag something you that you have published, I would expect you to kind of try to do something about it, right? Mm. Um, so this is a bit sad. But something unfortunate that we have seen, um, maybe, I mean, most, many journals now I know have uh, science integrity teams that are, are looking into this in more detail. Some of them just tell you it takes too long because the authors don't reply until like after a year or so, and this is a problem. And yeah, so mm -hmm. I think it's really, it depends on the case, on the editor, maybe also on the journal a bit, I think. Yeah, and yeah, understandably so. I know so many editorial boards are like just overworked with having small teams and then having to deal with all kinds of issues. First of all, finding reviewers to start with, and then mm -hmm. to the handling. Um. All right. So now, um, besides the post-publication peer review that we just talked about, you're also mm -hmm. looking at the replicability of particular topics within nanoparticle research, which is intracellular sensing. Yeah. First of all, we made a promise in the beginning to explain the different difference between <laughs> replicability and reproducibility. And you're looking at the reproducibility, sorry. Well, so. a, a bit of both, I think, but yeah. Um, yes, so this is, I think, uh, I know there's a lot of confusion when it comes to replicability and uh, reproducibility. And I think it's also, um, uh, at least from my reading, 
it's very um i want i i maybe i should say just like field dependent i think mm-hmm. yeah so in computer science they use it in a different way i also maybe because they have like codes or a different material than than us in the sciences so um yeah um reproducibility so i try to stick to the the definition that i got from the iu pack for for chemistry and mainly reproducibility is testing the similarity between the results that you get um when testing mainly the same you have the same material but you're testing them under different conditions right yeah so this is reproducibility and rep- replicability would be testing them under the exact same conditions. And well, we're using, well, we're doing mainly a, a bit of both, I would say. Mm-hmm. So we have also, then you have the branching of replication into a direct replication and conceptual replication, which we're also trying to do a bit of. Oh, okay. So things get a bit more complicated then. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> direct right. replication. Well. <laughs> Is thing that you could replicate? Is that conceptual replication? Or to assume based on the information you get? Or conceptual replication would be practically testing the hypotheses. Oh. Well, so you're putting the the hypothesis specific for me, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is a bit it is a bit complex. Again, now rigor has also joined the game on robustness and you have all these new R's that are joining. So it's a bit, yeah, it's getting a bit complicated to keep up with the definitions. Um so yeah, um for us we're we're looking into that. This uh, there has been I know a uh replication or reproducibility initiative in cancer research and biomedical sciences, but not in, in the field of nanoscience. And so mm-hmm. this is the first um, initiative that we have. Um, so we set it up almost a year ago, and it was really more difficult, I must say, than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. Because just to the, the first step to test the reproducibility of the research, again, is because we're, we're interested in one specific topic or one specific subject, is really finding the articles in a, I mean, in a very non-biased way, right? I mean, mm. selecting the articles that you want to, that whose reproducibility you want to test. And to do this, we worked with linguists, also philosophers, computer scientists, and uh, natural science and scientists to come up with a query to find the articles of interest to us. And... We also put a set of criteria. So we based our our selection on the citations. Mm -hmm. So to us, it's the the higher citations you have, the more influence you have made, at least in in the field. And yeah, we took um, citations as as average citations per year, basically. Um, We also tried to look at articles from the... higher impact journals in the field of nanoscience. Um, just to, we, we chose amongst four. So now eventually we have, after all the filtering and selections we did, we ended up with eight articles that we're planning to, to replicate. Um, and this is, uh, we haven't started lab work yet, but so the first step again was selection. Then after the selection process, what we do is we critically analyze the articles to see what problems we already may have, um, Mm. or if anyone has commented on them online, basically. Then we select experiments because again, we have a budget that's not endless. So we need to make sure that we look into the experiments that are really crucial to answering the question. Um, and then we have to, we, what we do is we draft protocols based on the methods section that you see in the and the articles. Unfortunately, not always complete these method, these, uh, method sections. So what we do is we do our best to try to get as much as possible from it. And then we send an email to the authors of the original mm-hmm. articles and we ask them if they think we need to add something and if this is a fair way to attempt to reproduce their their articles um, and, or replicate them. 
And we also are trying to adopt the registered reports. Mm -hmm. so... Yeah, it's maybe so the register is described by the Center for Open Science or it's probably yeah. also more broadly, but they advocate a lot for it. And I think that was just one of the first ones to my knowledge mm -hmm. who postulated what registered reports and pre-registrations, depending on what discipline you're looking at, um, should entail and defining standards for that. Which honestly is uh, is really nice. I mean, mm. once once you think about it, you think, oh wow, yeah, that makes sense. Of course, like, right? Why don't yeah. we, like? Huh? But isn't it like my question would also be most? Well, I didn't have to do that. Well, I sort of had to write a project proposal, and mm -hmm. how in your experience now, how does a project proposal differ from a registered report? I guess it's more detailed and more also it's way more detailed yeah. oriented and also timelines cool. so um we we don't have a time at least so we're we're trying to do the registered reports with the uh, peer community and PCI uh, registered reports mm -hmm. um, so it's quite detailed, I must say. Mm -hmm. And um, with them, you have a table that you need to fill up, you know, like analysis plan, sampling plan, all the details. And then you have the, the actual protocols there. And I think it's quite detailed. And um, it's long. <laughs> it is quite long. So how, okay, because I feel many people would fear that it takes a lot of time to write such a report before even getting started and exploring what are we trying to find out here? Well, you start from a hypothesis and then digging in with research li uh, literature research, um, mm -hmm. studying some of your experiments before you can even anticipate what the project's going to unfold towards. But still, I would mm -hmm. also argue it makes a lot of sense. And Having a template or basically a catalog of questions to respond to, to fill in such a report, is it that, depending on the nature of the project, you don't have to fill all of those fields, you know? Exactly. Right? So this is the, this is the first problem we had was we're, we, we fill them up in a way that we see makes sense to us and we kind of tailored it, let's say. We tailored the, the table and then um, we yeah we struggled a bit with it we we sent it and then we were asked to really try to stick as much as possible to the original format of the table um we again we sent it back now so we're still on the first uh, registered report but we sent it back we tried to as much as possible really stick to the to the table but i have heard um from someone at the, I think that works with someone closely at the OSF or at the OSF actually, when they talked, they had the talk about post, uh, about sorry pre-registrations and they said that if you get in touch with them, they can tailor it to, to the different fields. So I think that's quite interesting. That's cool. Yeah, um, that's that's good to know. Also, um, yeah, the Center for Open Science is doing a lot of pioneering work um, towards um, research integrity with um, um, developing tools and, and guides for the various stakeholder groups. But now with this registered reports, um, so yeah, I, I, I would think like for any anyone who's listening and finds this interesting, it is also a concept that can be adopted on a, on a project level to start with. Yes. I you know, look up what the Center for Open Science has developed, or the PCI community, the community in has developed as a standard format, and then just fill in as much as you can already apply to at a given time. And what's important to note is that some people fear that, like, oh, once postulated, we have to follow it uh, through. But the the key is to document any deviations and changes from the project or originally set out, right? And then getting yeah reasons and argumentation on this then is the documentation of the actual scientific process which we all love so much and, and yes, appreciate. Yes. this is yes this is exactly you appreciate it once you see this and i know several people have actually expressed this concern that as you said i mean 
if what if you deviate a bit what if you know we're not sure this is going to work what if we need to change something and yeah what, what you just i think you reassured the the speakers is is very important to, to keep That's in mind how science goes really how yeah. it will yeah. change like it's not that it's set in stone it's the plan and also in the corporate world things change all of the time but what we want to make sure is that we know we put the money and how we allocate the resources and yes. if changes occur then we have good reasons for those changes to be implemented i completely agree yeah <clears throat> mm. Cool. Um, so intracellular sensing, does that make you a biological bio, bi, biologist heart happy <laughs> to be <laughs> focusing on? It does. Wait, there's a difference between intercellular sensing between no and then intracellular sensing. So the one yeah. is between two two cells, it usually yes. it's to each other, but sometimes there can mm -hmm. also be some other cells in between. And um, but one cell signaling to another. But intracellular sensing, no, that's, that's another thing I have difficulty to wrap my head around. So the signaling going on inside one cell. Ooh. So practically in, inside of the cell, yeah. Um, it's more of a, of a single cell um, mechanism. Um, it's not even a mechanism, but yeah, it defines something inside of a cell. So for these nanoparticles, um, so these nanoparticles are used for for many reasons in, in biomedicine, I would say. Mainly they can be used for drug delivery mm -hmm. um, or for imaging, for example, mm -hmm. the MR, or also for intracellular sensing. So what they sense is they have been promising that these nanoparticles um, can sense biomolecules um, inside of the cell and can help with diagnosis. So okay, can... just to stop you there, so biomolecules, here we're talking on, I mean, whoever can still follow us, looking inside a cell, um, I will dig up, there was a beautiful film um, mm -hmm. by a research lab leader in France, with Sumer, which I had the honor of visiting as an undergraduate student, mm -hmm. and he produced a children's animated movie Okay. To explain what a cell is and the cellu cellu cellular particles and components it entails. So I'll dig that movie up also for you and everyone else enjoy. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but then who can whoever can still follow what we're talking about is we're looking at the nucleus, so the the very like which actually in the in the what is it, in the in the normal stage, if you can say so, of a cell. When it's not dividing and proliferating and allowing us to grow and grow old and whatnot, um, uh, is where the DNA is packaged. Um, and then there's other components such as the okay. Now I have to dig into my still active the side. <laughs> the organelle. Okay. There's so many ribosomes. Uh, yeah. ER. What was ER again? And the Yes. Um, mitochondrias yeah so this is actually i'm happy that you that you mentioned this because this was the next point that these nanoparticles sense something that are not inside of these organelles that are actually in the cytosome so oh, the space the that inside like, of the cell but outside of the organelles yeah so like it's, the like, it's also a liquid right yes as you can see it's like the it's like the yeah it's like the the liquid that kind of builds the buffer for keeping the organelles in shape kind of thing. Or the solution where the organelles are sitting in. Yeah, oh. I think that's an accurate way of describing it. Um, yeah, so these, um, these nanoparticles need to sense messenger RNAs, for example, different types of RNAs, which you don't need to, I think that this, the listeners yeah. don't need to. Worry. I'll just, so with us, everybody else just enjoy the conversation for what it is. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, for these nanoparticles to be taken up by the cells, we have different mechanisms. And one mechanism is, is endocytosis. For I mean, it depends also on the on the size of the molecule that wants that needs to be that is taken up by the cell. So the size, the the charge, and 
mainly the material that it's made of. Mm -hmm. And so these nanoparticles go inside of the cell with endocytosis and they're practically enveloped when they enter the cell. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get too technical, um, but to, to, to sense anything outside of this vesicle that they're in or this envelope that they're in, they need to exit it. And this is one aspect um, that the articles that we are looking into really rarely ever mention. So there's no mention of how these nanoparticles are taken up by the cell, even though this research study is just focused on how this nanoparticle can be used to detect something inside of the cell. Mm. So this is practically, um, the, this is preliminary to anything is knowing that this nanoparticle is taken up into the cell, right? Yeah. And is this, which is also a common um, problem in science communication through publishing, is this because the community of bioscience focused nanoparticle mm -hmm. researchers uh, knows what's happening so that's kind of not even worth discussing anymore or is it that there's different variants variations possible of how to getting the the particles inside the cell and it would actually make a crucial difference and would be important um, to be mentioned although yeah probably both depending <laughs> I, I think um, I think in many times the the articles that we're looking into the teams are I mean the, the the authors are not necessarily biologists and I think this is really quite specific to biologists. All right. Yeah. Um, I also would imagine that if you are focusing or if you have a research article that I mean eventually you hope to get into clinics one day, mm -hmm. um, you need to at least like look into the basics with a, someone that really knows how things are working in the cell. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, this is, this is a problem. Like if they, if this is because of um, not knowing how, how these work and you just think that if you put things inside of the medium, the cell will just take it up and it's good to go. I, I don't know if this is just this or there are other ways, but even when you look at, there are other reasons, sorry. And even if you look at the graphical abstracts, sometimes you just see the images of like a nanoparticle and then an arrow, and then it's inside the cell. Mm. It almost seems like it, it's a bit ma magical, I would say. And it's a bit over, over, oversimplified. Yeah, okay. I think that's a problem that we observe in many disciplines because we now have so much publication pressure going on and so many articles being published and so many, much specification mm -hmm. um, in mostly the STEM disciplines, but probably cross-cutting, I don't know, about social sciences, humanities, and other problems. But that it's actually difficult to to step back and still be able to see the full picture. Or even the particular research team. I also struggled myself as a PhD student. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm doing molecular biology day in and day out. But then mm -hmm. you think about the wider context and the actual context and how this actually works in a living system. Mm -hmm. uh, only once and so a few times during your PhD or during the research project. And I think it's vital to have checkpoints with specialists on the same or similar question or related question with specialists from other disciplines who can actually explain what's going on um, so that you can refer your findings and also base your experimentation on facts and not just assumptions. And I completely agree, yeah. And also I think... Um... Like maybe sometimes uh, I I speak with my colleague, the philosopher of science, so he has done some biology, and I I said to him, do you think if these exact same articles were to be published in biology oriented journals, would they pass peer review? And honestly, I don't think so. Now this may be a problem of a of a field that again is at the interface of several. <laughs> fields and yeah so i don't know if i mean obviously the the authors have the, they have the main i mean they're the main producers of this work they are the producers of this work 
um, but also the responsibility, I mean, on, on reviewers. Yeah, well, I think you mentioned also, it. like, an important part of your work is to check if the claims can be true based on what the paper presents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes um, the claims are exaggerated also because that would help the publishing in certain journals because innovation mm -hmm. and um, what's the other word like relevant no, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. but and I think it's, maybe those articles would hold true from a nano science point of view but now contextualized in a wider biological system becomes problematic possibly um But also, of course, within the nanoscience context only, it still makes sense if you're looking at a biological system. But even mm -hmm. on molecular biology, we know that we strip off most of the complexity of living systems on a mm -hmm. daily basis, and then we make mm -hmm. assumptions also in biology, which are outrageous if you think about it. Like we can't really mm -hmm. claim, make those claims looking at only one or two species, which are totally unrelated. Mm -hmm. And then extrapolate that for all living species on the planet. Like what? <laughs> I completely agree. Um, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. But, so yeah. No. But okay. So what's what's uplifting though in all of this discussion, which can be frightening at times, and also uh, like you said in the beginning, like how how you got sad and scared and or scared mm -hmm. in the sense of oh. What are we doing here with research? Mm -hmm. um, but there's an increasing... Well, first of all, I would say that most researchers have the best interest in mind with their research and intentions. Mm -hmm. um, also to inform society of what may or may not be happening in the cell or mm -hmm. other um, things we're exploring. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah, we have the publication pressure, which is currently... Um, the the biggest um obstacle for mm -hmm. integrity really in academia we we have i think we have similar issues in politics and journalism which is probably the same motive like to make money for and to amaze in whichever way mm -hmm. um rather than sticking to what we know as facts which can sometimes be boring and disappointing but at least it's reliable <laughs> <laughs> yes Yeah, and in science, looking at the complexity of research disciplines alone and what we study as researchers cannot be mm -hmm. boring on its own. Like, really, think about it. But okay, but the good news is there is an increasing amount of integrity checkpoints being implemented. Thanks for doing that work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what's What's like the typical question? In a, it's not a job interview, but what? Or what's next on your agenda? Like, what? What's your next chapter of um, integrity-related activities within the team, or do you yeah. have a new project inside that you dig into in the next two, three years? Or so. Um, yeah, we still have two years on the reproducibility project we haven't still started with the experiment so this is going to be exciting two mm -hmm. years and um um honestly after that i've been i i really want to work on on like setting a course on on research integrity um i feel like We we have courses. I don't know how it is in Germany, but I know in France there is a mandatory course that that you can take, um, that you must take actually before you can get your you can defend your thesis. But it's so simplified, I would say. Um, it's so basic to really inform about is, the pitfalls of my career. Yes, I mean now we're we've been involved in several um, activities, kind of, to introduce students at different levels to to what we do, and you see them getting really excited, and this is very exciting for us as well, like looking um, looking into into articles or just explaining how Puppier works. Mm -hmm. We try to encourage um, students to, to use Puppier. We have had some students get in touch with 
some of the, the researchers on the post-location peer review team and asking them, would you like that? Can we publish with you a comment on this article? Because we realized something, you know, doesn't necessarily, is not adding up. And yeah, I think it's, well, there's always, you know, you need to strike a balance between not scaring people off and, not, and really just alerting them or keeping them aware of the issues that you see. So this is something I would like to put together. Um, mm -hmm. I would like to set, yeah, a course on, on that. I mm -hmm. don't know how, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we like what we can start with is also in my personal interest and in the wider interest of access to perspectives and affiliates mm -hmm. we work with is maybe looking into the resources like we're currently doing for peer review mm -hmm. but there's various institutions now informing about research integrity and in different aspects but mm -hmm. which which can be well inf is certainly informative then also they each look at different um yeah like i said aspects of integrity mm -hmm. i think what would be would be good oh and then in the previous episode it's not released yet by the time this one is released the other one will also be released we talked to Jigisha Patel where we were talking also a lot about peer review primarily but also no well, no, well peer review and also integrity mm -hmm. and then we postulated or um, yeah basically postulated it and now the question is do you agree that research integrity is more or less the same as what we know as good scientific practice but where one is more of this is how we do things and how we act as researchers and like best practices or good practices in a scholarly context, whereas research integrity looks at possible misbehaviors and this, like, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just how to, okay, no, I can't really remember. I have to listen again what, what exactly we came up with. But, so it's, it's a form of ethics, but also mm -hmm. good scientific practice. And the baseline, oh yeah, and then we came up with, isn't it that open science principles now give us a, a guideline to implement and ensure research integrity can happen from a technical and workflow mm -hmm. kind of process point of view. Do, do you agree with that? So like, uh, I, yeah, I, I, yeah, so I, I, I think those agree. three concepts together or differentiated under the flagship of ethics, like at the end mm -hmm. of the day, we're talking about ethical behavior, yeah. um, morally, um, moral behavior, like standing true to our values and principles as humans and in this mm -hmm. scholars and academics and how we do things. Yeah. And then, yeah, research integrity, good scientific practices, open science principles. Isn't that all the same, more or less? And then different... More or less, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if research integrity may encompass... It. I think it's more of a general term, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, each is also very specific on its own, but we like I think the common denominator is... Yeah, it's all about... Uh, moral and ethics as as we do science together for mm -hmm. a purpose and now you can argue oh isn't basic research different from applied research in a sense yes but then research integrity and ethics still ask and this is a recurring topic also for me and that I often bring up like should we still be doing research just because we can for the sake of it or I think also researchers have always had these discussions yes. uh, because when when we come up with an idea and we figure, oh, it's actually ethically concerning mm -hmm. to be let go of that thought and not do the experiment. Yeah, yes. Well, we have, unfortunately, in history, we have very um, uh, many examples of how science can go like painfully wrong. Unfortunately. Moral concerns or human rights violations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that's still ongoing to varying degrees, but okay, that's for another topic and another day. I don't know if it has to be in this forum, but um, okay, 
I'm trying to find a positive twist to where we are. So, <laughs> and I think we had one earlier. So let's. Um, so, so I, I would I would like to believe and and defend that most researchers, if not all, start off from the best interest and intention in doing the research most thoroughly and documenting well, and then reality is kicking. Mm -hmm. So your job is now to flag um, those realities of mm -hmm. where things have gone wrong and then helping to identify those in order for us to, as a community and scholar, mm -hmm. scholarship, for us to define standards and best practices again or redefine those so that we can move with time. And now that we're dealing with digital tools and also um, tools that help us to identify misbehaviors quicker, like imaging kind of software to identify where duplications, yeah, duplications. Yeah, yeah. So we have all of that at hand, but yeah, again, it's a bit sad that we need it, but it's also common, common for humans to like, there's always there's always that aspect, and it's a matter of self-insuring or self-correcting us ourselves as a community and supporting us in, okay, now that we see a rise in mis misbehaviors um, through publications, there's something wrong in the system, and we are now that, but now we have also um, ways and we can identify interventions to mm -hmm. turn that around again. No, I uh, yeah. This is I think this is the positive point again. Like having these, um, I think for the first step is really like pinpointing the problem, right? And I think uh, more and more people are are aware now of of the kind of misconduct, research misconduct that happens, and just trying to find these simple solutions. I think so. For us, we're trying to look to how, where, why, and um, uh, where is it? What? Yeah. Um, what are the what are the practically the barriers to science correction? Hmm. So how, when, and why does science fail to correct itself? Mainly, and this I think is is interesting to see what. As, and as we talked about earlier, like sometimes, as you said, some maybe editors may not necessarily reply. This is, for example, this may be a barrier. Um, authors of original articles not responding is another barrier. Protocols that are missing really crucial uh, information that you need to be able to replicate this work is also another barrier, for example. Um, so we've come across quite a lot of challenges. And uh, as you said, I think guidelines, um, this will help us in establishing some guidelines that will, um, yeah, just yeah. hopefully we will adhere to and things start to get brighter. Yeah, because research is complex. It's a complex endeavor and profession yes. to start mm -hmm. with. It's very exciting and mm -hmm. there's a lot of pressure points. So the more guidance and the more we can simplify the process wherever possible, because the research itself mm -hmm. is already so difficult um the thing will be appreciated and so again thank you so much for doing that work thank you the team, thank you so much for joining us today and thank you it was a pleasure uh, yeah and welcome back anytime we want to send updates and might also be in touch in in integrity research integrity conversations awesome um so yeah thanks and thank all you. the best thanks thank you Thanks for joining us to listen to this episode. Do let us know what you think. You can email us or connect with us on our social media channels, which you can find on our website at accesstoperspectives.org. Email us at info at accesstoperspectives.org or book a call to explore how we can support you with your research planning, management and publishing. Welcome you again soon for our next episode. Until then, have a great time.